Well, good morning, and uh, welcome to Forge Road Bible Chapel online uh, for our second week. We thank you for being here. Uh, it's 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 fun to to, to look at the uh, at the chat window and see uh, see lots of uh, notes and people that are online. It's uh, it, it, it's really encouraging to see you. We got a lot of comments from last week. Um, most of them were uh, people like seeing Carol, uh, which uh, I, I, I really can't argue with. And I dare JP to be with us this morning. And of course, he being him, he is with us as well. And so we're, uh, we're just grateful to be here. And we're grateful to share this morning, uh, worshiping the Lord. And we're going to do uh, a little bit more than we did last week. You've already heard some music. We're going to have some more music as we go. Um, our brother Kyle Sobis will be uh, will be sharing a message this morning, and uh, and uh, the, the events this week. Uh, we, we last week we had uh, if you if you weren't a part we had some Bible studies on Wednesday night. The men's and the women's Bible studies were were on this same platform on Zoom. So uh, we encourage you to, uh, to 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 log in and to be a part of that. To look for the links that are that are that are coming out for those. Um, Next week, our, uh, our our brother Brad, uh, our brother Brad Sturm will be with us as we uh, as we continue. He's gonna he was supposed to be here uh, at this week, uh, and 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 of course that trip got canceled. But uh, but we're grateful that uh, he can be with us uh, virtually, and we can do this just as easily from Alaska as we can uh, from our living room. So uh, so we're looking forward to that. Um, we're going to also expand this thing as we go a little bit more um, next week. Uh, one of the things that 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 uh, we have missed greatly, and I'm sure you have too, is the ability to uh, to worship the Lord uh, uh, as remembering His death through the breaking of the bread. And and uh, we want to be able to do that. We're going to try something next week. We're working on it, and uh, hopefully, uh, it, 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 it's it's not going to be everything we're used to, uh, but hopefully, we can share together in that as we remember the Lord. And his death um, next week. Um, as you know, there are many needs in uh, in our community, in our city, in our state, um, and, and all over the world. And and uh, we we are uh, we're praying along with you as as people are in need and and are suffering. Um, there's a there's a lot that uh, is going on, and one of the reasons that we're doing what we're doing is to is is to be uh, to reach out to our community. What we are, we are we are forsaking our meeting, um, really for the sake of of the vulnerable among us, and and uh, so we we pray for them. We want to continue to pray for them, and uh, and 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 we would encourage you. I I I I thank you. It's been a great encouragement to me as people have been uh, has have been continued to share and continue to to send checks in various ways and to continue. To, to, to share with us financially. And, uh, you know, we don't talk about that a lot and we understand why, but I, I, I wanna thank you for that and encourage you that as, as there are more and more needs, uh, not only in our community, but in our body, um, we, we, we want to be able to reach out and to share with them. And we want to encourage you, just as Paul said, to be, uh, to, 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 to be partakers of the grace of the gospel, to be, to be participants in the gospel, even as he says in Philippians chapter one, we're we're going to be starting a uh, a series in Philippians in uh, in three weeks. Norris Gorman is going to be speaking, and then I'll be speaking a week after that. And these thoughts from Philippians one are, are are very much in my mind as we can share together in the gospel, um, just as surely as uh, I'm sure I'm sure my brother Brad would th- would would agree with me that uh, where he is, we we can share in that ministry that he has as we give to him and as we support him with our prayers and with our thoughts and, and, and with our finances as well. So we uh, continue to thank you for that and look for that. If you any, have any questions about how to do that, feel free to call me and, uh, and, and I'd love to hear from you. So at this time, we're gonna continue with some songs. We have four songs for you and then I'll be back after that. Well, I love that song. I've been singing it all week. He is worthy of all blessing, honor, and glory, isn't he? Um, we've got one more song, and, and then Kyle's going to come. But before that, um, we actually, uh, I think, 
we have Brad uh, Sturm actually on the line. I wanted to, to have a chance to chat with him for you to see him. It's as easy to do, like I said, from Alaska. It's pretty amazing. Um, Brad, how are you doing? How's your family doing? How did you survive the, uh, the long, cold winter? Yeah, we're doing super good. The family is good, and um, we survived, and, and that's definitely definitely the word. It was, I think we got more snow this year than, than we have in, or Alaska has in 70 years. So we had buildings collapsing, and if you could look out of my front window, I, I have snow higher than the than our house. It's It's been a pretty crazy winter, um, but we made it through it, and the Lord did some amazing things through it so we're 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 really joyful well the uh obviously the the coronavirus has changed our lives and and here we are on the on the east coast we we kind of think that maybe the interior of alaska might be a little more isolated but uh, i guess i understand that it's uh, it's affected you guys as well yeah uh, obviously i'm not in maryland right now um so our our big trip was was canceled due to due to the coronavirus and life here much like life there um, has kind of just come to a screeching halt um, there, uh, there's state mandated uh, bans on travel even interstate so my parents are with us right now and they're stuck until they raise it because no one can fly in or out um, except for medical reasons and um, so yeah pretty much life life is is uh, uh, unique as it is for all of us so so uh so what's new uh in your ministry and and uh and how can we uh how can we share with you and and pray for you uh in the coming days and weeks yeah um well new to our ministry again as i'm sure it is new to your ministry is figuring out ways to reach out to the community right now where uh it would be really easy to say ministry is just on hold um because can't visit people can't shake people's hands can't go over and and do things like that um but the lord has opened up other doors so we kind of follow cdc guidelines and help people uh, especially the older community in towns so that's been really good people that don't come to our church um have taken us up on doing things like grocery shopping for them or taking their garbage out or bringing them um, mail and things like that has been really nice doing a lot of snow shoveling. Um, and so we're asking the Lord to use this crazy situation to um, uh, further his kingdom and open up doors and opportunities for people to hear the gospel. And that's another thing, like you guys are doing this stuff online. Um, we're doing something similar. It's not live. I record a message and um, put it online on our message board and we've had a lot of people in the community that have never ever stepped foot in the doors of the church watch it just because it's there and they watch it and have actually commented to me on it um so we're we're begging the lord to use use this use everyone sitting in front of their computers as a door an opportunity to introduce someone to the gospel and to their son so those are definitely big prayers um life before this uh was a lot of hospitality and um uh, we've been building up the leadership team in in mcgrath as well and studying through first corinthians um so kind of a lot of the same uh stuff that we've been doing and uh kind of a new push if there's anything new um our new push is really trying to build relationships with struggling churches throughout the interior. Um, and uh, so build relationships specifically with the leadership of those churches, uh, what leadership there uh, is, just to encourage them. And we're looking at, and this is actually kind of an interesting thing, before all this happened, we were looking at, at, at avenues like Zoom um, for how to build relationships and and get FaceTime and, and fellowship with churches and even churches around the interior that don't have anyone to teach Sunday mornings. And it's physically impossible to visit them and carry out services, except for maybe now as internet and technology grows. And now we're kind of testing the system because we have to, and it seems to be working. And so who knows what the Lord might do through this, this situation as far as being able to um, edify 
uh, really small, tiny congregations scattered throughout the interior because of what we're, we're doing right now. So that's, that's a new ministry thing that we're excited about. Well, we appreciate uh, all that you're doing. A lot of things that we can do right here as well in our community. And, and we're, we're excited for, for what you've got and for what the Lord has for all of us. There's a lot of changes, aren't there? And, and there are things that we're doing differently yeah. than we've ever uh, been able to do. I was talking to somebody yesterday and they said, what, what would this have been like 20 years ago? Uh, so many of these yeah. things that just are not possible. Uh, the Lord is in it all, and, uh, and we appreciate uh, knowing that and take comfort in that. Um, we're going to do one more song. Uh, thank you, Brad. We, we appreciate you. We're, we're going to see you next week as you minister yeah. the word, and we look forward to that. Uh, we're going to do one more song. This is, a, this is an interesting one. I've seen a few of these online. Uh, this is the members of the Toronto Symphony that are uh, improvising, just sort of like we are, and, and doing things in a new way, a way that you can connect uh, maybe not physically, but you can still do things uh, together, even if it's online, uh, even, even making some, uh, some pretty ama amazing music. Uh, so we'll, 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 we'll show this, and then I'll give it to, uh, to my brother Kyle Sobas as he ministers uh, the word this morning. Hey, everybody. Um, if, if memory serves... I believe that I played that song in middle school, in my middle school band, and I'm sure it sounded, it sounded just like that. Um, I'm so glad that, uh, that, we, can, that we can meet in, in some way together. I really, I really miss you guys very much. Um, I thought I'd start with this, uh, this joke about the, the quarantine. I'm sure you've seen, seen something like this, um, where we all start out with some kind of new hobby or new undertaking uh, and find, like this gentleman here, that on day four, we're just pouring the ice cream into the pasta and um, <laughs> and struggling to, to deal with this this new reality. Um, personally, I tried to make some kombucha for the first time, and I'm pretty sure I killed the killed the scoby, and so that's that's going well. Um, and it's just, you know, it's been a, it's been a very strange uh, and unique time in I think all of our lives. Um, but during this time, it has been, it has just been really really encouraging, really good. Um, to hear from a lot of you and to uh, read devotional thoughts from from one another and to be to be encouraged by that um, I, I hope that that may be a, a practice that continues long term uh, that like like Brad was saying that even um, even this event could be uh, could be used for for good for the good of um, for the good of ourselves and for the good of, of God's kingdom. And so today, I want to uh, officially welcome you all to Forge on Zoom. Um, I'm excited to share this message with you. This is uh, a message that has been on my mind, um, on my heart for a long, for a long time. I was uh, just reading in uh, the letter to the Hebrews, and there, there was just a particular verse that um, it just jumped off the page at me, and and I think it is just uh, especially relevant and and helpful uh, during this time. Um, this very strange thing that we're experiencing, uh, which I want to I want to talk about just a little bit. So there's this quote that's been attributed uh, to Mark Twain. It says, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. And it is a, a fitting and pithy and Mark Twain sort of statement, um, but it's not really something that can be sourced to him. Uh, this, is the, this is the, I guess, the real quote. It's a, it's a little bit more involved, but um, I think it's true. It says, 
history never repeats itself, but the kaleidoscopic combinations of the pictured present often seem to be constructed out of the broken fragments of antique legends. This is actually Mark Twain. Um, and I think if we were to consider our current circumstances, if we were to consider uh, this, this new virus that has frankly taken the world by storm, um, it rings pretty true. We've, we have seen things like this before, but not on repeat. It's a, uh, it's on a pattern. Um, it's a, it's a play on a pattern that we've seen before. And, and I think we're going to see that, uh, the Bible actually does something pretty similar. Um, and that's what I hope to spend some time on today. And I hope that we can, uh, learn that together and, uh, and be encouraged by, by what we see. So we, we mentioned, I mentioned that there's, there's a bit of a, of a rhyme to history. Um, and so I, I thought it would be, um, relevant, unfortunately, to start with, um, what, what, what was the most consequential, uh, pandemic in, uh, in, in the last century, uh, which was the 1918 Spanish flu. Um, ironically, the Spanish flu doesn't seem to have actually started in Spain. Uh, the first known case of the Spanish flu has been traced back to Kansas, uh, where this picture was taken from a military hospital. And so this avian flu um, would start in 1918 and spread all around the world as, um, as armies went to and fro from different continents to fight in World War I. Uh, and as people went home from the war, uh, it was taken all over, back all over the world. Um, eventually, there would be an estimated at least 500 million cases, uh, which at the time was about one third of the world population. It's been, uh, identified as, uh, as the cause of death for 50 million people. And it, it was surely uh, a much more deadly event than the one that we're experiencing. Though, though our circumstances are, are plenty serious. Um, history does seem to rhyme. This seems to be uh, the worst pandemic that's, that we've experienced, maybe since the Spanish flu. Uh, by now, cases in the United States have reached uh, about 150,000, essentially, essentially doubling uh, the total number of cases from, from China, where this disease originated. And we see a, uh, a doubling in the number of cases right now, every, about every three days. Um, I'm sure everybody's heard a lot about bending the curve. Uh, and about social or physical distancing. And that's, that's the entire idea here, is that as we, as we do this, as we take these drastic steps in our lives, um, that we will slow down the doubling of the case rate and eventually flatten the curve. And by doing so, we'll hopefully prevent our uh, hospitals across the country who are already um, lacking in adequate supplies and space uh, to handle such a burden um, will prevent them from being overwhelmed. And so uh, this, this picture here, which looks very much like the picture of the uh, Kansas um, military hospital in the Spanish flu, this picture came from uh, Salem, Oregon, where they're, where they're preparing for uh, the reality that they may not have enough hospital beds um, and so this is, this is what we see in our lives right now. Our lives are, are different for having to deal with uh, some, some unforeseen um, life-changing event. So concepts like working from home and not being face-to-face -face with one another, but 
trying to figure out how to do these Zoom video calls. Um, little things like my, the fact that my car has been sitting in the garage for two full weeks. Uh, we have just in this time been asked to reconsider just about everything that we do. Um, from handshaking, we, we don't shake hands anymore, uh, to realizing how constantly we touch our faces and being told that that's not a good idea, uh, to finding answers to the questions of how can we support and love one another when we can't be physically together. Um, and it was encouraging already to hear, to hear from Brad and to hear about how they're, how they're doing that in Alaska already. Um, and I hope that's something that we, can, that we can take forward here as well. And so in this time, and as we look for answers to, to questions like these and to, um, to bigger ones about, about really stepping back and reevaluating, uh, using this time to reevaluate what the general pattern of our lives looks like. I thought it would be good for us to study Hebrews chapter eight today. And I hope that, um, I hope that we'll find some, some encouragement in these verses and that you will all uh, see some of the same beauty and challenge and hope that I've come to see in these verses. So let's pray. And then we're going to read together uh, the first five verses of Hebrews chapter eight. Father, we thank you so much for today. Thank you that we can, uh, that we can connect in this way, that um, even though we are on this, even on this call, spread all across this country, um, that we can share with one another uh, and that we can share with you. Thank you so much for your word uh, and for your son who binds us all together. Thank you, Lord, for the ways that you've revealed yourself to us in our lives and even during this crisis. We pray that you would, um, that you would show us how to, uh, how to love one another well, um, that we would care for our brothers and sisters, and that we would look out for our neighbors, and that we would, um, that we would be a shining light to them. Uh, that they would be encouraged, that they would um, draw near to you and um, see your son as their savior and Lord. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus, it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. They serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. So what's happening here in Hebrews chapter 8 is that the author has reached a, a turning point a high point in his argument, he is uh, writing or speaking maybe to a group of people who know Christ and who seem to know the Old Testament well, but at least to some degree, and who appear maybe to be ready to go back to the old system of ritual and law. This is sort of the religious version of, of history rhyming. But the author's point is this, that in all things, Jesus Christ is superior. He is everything that the past and the law and the prophets and the kings had ever pointed to, but failed to be. And everything that the readers or listeners were considering 
considering turning back to, is only a copy and a shadow of the real things, of the heavenly things. Everything that we know outside of Christ only serves at best as part of the pattern that leads to him and is fulfilled in him. And this verse, Hebrews chapter 8, it just, something about it just really struck me. Um, I'm, I'm excited to talk about this with you guys today. Because it's incredible to think, um, what, what did Moses see? What is the pattern that he was shown on the mountain? What does that have to do with Jesus? And what does that have to do with us today? Uh, and that's what I want to consider. And I think the first thing maybe to notice about this verse is that the second half of it is a near direct quote from Exodus chapter 25. So we can all go there now and pick up some context. So Exodus 25 verse 40 says, And see that you make them after the pattern for them, which is being shown you on the mountain. And so you can see this is nearly a direct quote um, of that second half of Hebrews 8 verse 5. And we find this verse in Exodus 25, where Moses is on Mount Sinai. He is meeting with God, um, and he is receiving the instruction for the building of the tabernacle and all of the furniture within it. And so it's important to note that the, uh, the tabernacle was essentially a kind of mobile temple. Uh, it was a very ornate tent, and its purpose was um, for God's presence to dwell among his people. Uh, it was a sanctuary that he would be able to dwell in their midst. And Moses was given instruction to build it and to build all of the furniture within it. It wasn't exactly blueprint-like instruction, uh, it's almost, it's symbolic. So I'm going to read an example from Exodus chapter 25. This is the verses leading up to um, verse 40 that we just read. This is the golden lampstand. It says, you shall make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be made of hammered work, its base, its stem, its cups, its calyxes, and its flowers shall be of one piece with it. And there shall be six branches going out of its sides, three branches of the lampstand out of one side of it, and three branches of the lampstand out of the other side of it. Three cups made like almond blossoms, each with calyx and flower, on one branch. And three cups made like almond blossoms, each with calyx and flower, on the other branch so for the six branches going out of the lampstand. And on the lampstand itself, there shall be four cups made like almond blossoms with their calyxes and flowers, and a calyx of one piece with it under each pair of the six branches going out from the lampstand. Their calyxes and their branches shall be of one piece with it, the whole of it a single piece of hammered work of pure gold. You shall make seven lamps for it, and the lamps shall be set up so as to give light on the space in front of it. Its tongs and their trays shall be of pure gold. It shall be made with all these utensils out of a talent of pure gold. And so that, uh, that was just one piece of the furniture of the tabernacle. And I promise that we won't read any more of that right now. Um, I know it can be, it can feel kind of dry at first take, uh, but there are some, there are some really amazing things going on there. Um, so just consider that in the instructions uh, for the lampstand, there are many images of Eden that we read, uh, of flowers and of trees that are good to eat, and gold and seven days of light as there were in creation. And consider also that the patterns and the parallels uh, can be identified between creation and Eden um, in the building of the tabernacle and its furnishings. So the creation account in Genesis is structured 
around seven acts of creation. Each is introduced by the phrase, and God said. And the tabernacle is structured in the same way. It's around seven acts, each introduced by the phrase, and the Lord said. And as we've already seen, there are numerous parallels between Eden and the tabernacle in that they both share garden imagery, tree and fruit imagery, gold and precious jewels, and just as the way back to Eden is guarded by cherubim, so too is the tabernacle. And there, there are more. Um, just as humans are made in the image of God, so the tabernacle is made after the pattern. Uh, and those words are, are pretty closely related in the Hebrew. And at the close of the creation account um, is the telling of the first Sabbath. And at the end of the instruction to build the tabernacle is a call to the Sabbath. See, it's because the, the tabernacle itself is, is more than just a fancy tent in the desert. It was the means by which God was restoring his fellowship with, um, with the humanity that he had created. And it starts with a tent in the desert, um, but it doesn't end there. And also, I just have to say that while I was thinking about this, I couldn't help but think to myself that uh, the tabernacle seems to have been the first case of glamping. And I can't hear or see any of you, so I'm just going to assume that you think this is funny too, um, that God, God ordained glamping in the Sinai desert. So don't let anybody tell you that it's not manly enough. This is what God wanted also. Just because you're in the wilderness doesn't mean that you shouldn't be able to wash your hands or have a table for your bread or a light for you to read by. We're not barbarians. But I really, more seriously, I really wonder what Moses saw while he was on the mountain with God. Um, some of the passages, the, the passages in this, in this section of Exodus are are really incredible. Uh, so I'm just going to read a, a little bit more. This is from Exodus 19, verse, starting at verse 16. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on the mountain to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. And then also from Exodus 24, this is verses 9 through 11. Just think about what Moses is, is seeing and experiencing here. It says, Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and ate and drank. And so eventually Moses, he goes up by himself. He is on this mountain for 40 days and the people are down below um, with Aaron and the rest and they're getting anxious. And so even while Moses is getting the instruction for the restoration of um, of fellowship between God and his creation, the instruction for the tabernacle, the instruction for how to relate to one another and how to relate to God. Um, what happens? The, the people get tired of waiting. They decide that they, they would rather have gods that they can control than a God that they can't control. And they build, they build the first idol, uh, the golden calf. Now, of course, this, this was not the first time that God uh, worked to fellowship with man. The tabernacle in the Exodus story is the first explicitly named tabernacle. Uh, but it's clear 
in looking back that Eden itself was a, a form of the tabernacle or um, a, a part, of, part of the pattern. They're both part of the pattern of tabernacles, sanctuaries where God dwells with his people uh, throughout scripture. And the Eden tabernacle is, uh, or the concept of an Eden as a, as a tabernacle is, it, it's almost haunting um, that the clearest picture of the fellowship that was shared between God and the first humans comes as it's being fractured. It says, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The concept here is, a, is of a regular daily walk uh, in the garden between Adam and Eve and God. But we know of it because after the fall, they hid themselves after uh, fracturing the trust that existed between, between them and the Lord. And then the Exodus, ta Exodus tabernacle, which we've already taken a look at, so I'm not going to dwell on, on this one. Um, but the, the pattern continues to develop from here. And so eventually, uh, when the people had come into the promised land and the line of kings had begun, um, Solomon, King David's son, uh, builds a temple for the Lord, a permanent temple. Uh, a permanent structure rather than a tent. And it says, when the priests came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Solomon's temple is an interesting case because there were, um, there were no instructions given in the way that God gave instructions to Moses. He, God was not involved in the design uh, and the instruction of the building of this temple um, in the same way. So make of that what you will. Um, but we know that eventually uh, the people fell into idolatry and uh, they were taken into exile and the temple uh, was destroyed. Um, seems to be that part of the pattern here is just that uh, every time God was uh, building a way for him to dwell with, uh, to have a sanctuary among his people, people found a way to, to mess it up. And so eventually um, they return. Uh, they return from exile. And in Ezra, they dedicate uh, what comes to be known as the second temple. It says, and the people of Israel, the priests and the Levites and the and the rest of the returned exiles celebrated with dedication this house of God with joy. But in this, in this particular case, there was something wrong because unlike, um, unlike past tabernacles, God's presence did not come down uh, in the same way that it did uh, with the cloud and the pillar in in exodus and with his presence in the first temple um, but then we come we come to the new testament and we have jesus who is uh, who is identified by john as as the tabernacle um, the new tabernacle in which god dwelt on earth with us uh, John, recall, John, John says it like this. He says, and the word became flesh and dwelt. It's the same, um, same word as tabernacle. The word became flesh and tabernacled among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. And so God, um, Jesus embodied the, the whole concept of, uh, the entire pattern um, of the tabernacle and the temple and all of its, all of its purpose and all of its symbolism um, in, his, in his life here on earth. And we, we, we are now um, 
the temple, the tabernacle uh, of God here on earth. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? You see, if we have come to know Jesus as our Savior and our Lord, then, then we, are, we are that temple. We are the tabernacle. We are called to be part of the pattern uh, that was started so, so long ago now. Um, and, and today, if we know the Lord, then we know that his spirit dwells with us. And for, for me, at least, this is both a great comfort um, and also a great challenge because if God's spirit dwells within us and if we are the tabernacle, then why haven't we quite we haven't quite closed the loop, have we? It's not, uh, the life that we're experiencing is not fully as it was in the garden. But if we are the tabernacle, then how do we, um, how do we do this? How do we make all things after the pattern shown, shown to you on the mountain? And so I, I want to talk in the time that we have left I know that I'm over. I'm so sorry. <laughs> but I know that we've talked about the pattern of the tabernacle and its furnishings and uh, as part of the pattern of creation and of fellowship. And we've talked about the pattern of tabernacles themselves. And then we come to the New Testament and, and, and we can see that there is um, that there's another, there's another pattern here. There's another part to the pattern that we've already, that we've already seen. Um, that just as Moses went up on Mount Sinai to, re to receive instruction from God uh, about, um, about relating to one another and relating with him and dwelling together, uh, we also have the sermon, the sermon on the Mount. And so basically... If you were to go and compare the, the story of Moses on Mount Sinai with the Sermon on the Mount, you would pick up on a lot of um, parallels. It is clearly uh, made to echo one another. Uh, Matthew seems to be setting up um, this scene as a version 2.0 of, of Moses on Mount Sinai. Um, both times it's noted that he went up on the mountain uh, both times there are, uh, on the one hand, Israel, and on the other, uh, the crowds that were following Jesus who were at the foot of the mountain. Moses is given the Ten Commandments, and Jesus uh, takes time to explain underlying principles of a number of the Ten Commandments. In both cases, there are kingdom principles that are given. Um, and where Moses gets the... Uh, the tabernacle design. Um, Jesus seems to give us uh, principles for relating with uh, not just one another, but also with God and about how to prepare our hearts to be, uh, to be the tabernacle on earth. Um, there's a lot, there's a lot more here. Um, I'm not going to get into all of it. And hopefully with some of the time that we have maybe not commuting or not doing all of the, uh, the other activities that we're used to doing. You could, you could spend some time comparing Exodus chapters 19 to 30 with Matthew chapters 5 to 7 um, and, and get a better picture of, of what this looks like. But the main point, the main point is this, that Jesus Christ himself fulfills the pattern of, uh, of the tabernacle, of God dwelling with us. Um, he is himself the true tabernacle. Um, Hebrews tells us that the, uh, the curtain, the torn curtain was his flesh, that his life is the ultimate sacrifice, and that he was himself the priest, the, high, the great high priest, who, ult who ultimately offered that sacrifice. And that by it, he sprinkles our hearts clean. He washes our bodies with pure water. 
and he makes us the dwelling place of God's spirit. A little later in Hebrews, it says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. See, the, the point for us is that as people who choose to follow Jesus, who believe that he is the Lord and Savior, that he's the risen Son of God, we enter into a work that has been completed. What we do with our lives we don't have to do out of obligation, out of a striving to be saved. Instead, we can work out the kingdom, the tabernacle of the heart principles from the Sermon on the Mount, which I, I just so encourage you to, to go back and read um, when you have time. Just knowing that we, we can, as it says at the, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, we build on the foundation of the finished work of Jesus, who is the ultimate prophet and priest and king, and the one who is the fulfillment of all the patterns that we see in scripture of, um, of tabernacles and of, uh, of meeting with the Lord on the mountain and all, all there's so many, so many more. Um, but I want to encourage us that, that what we do now in this very particular uh, and unique time and place in history with this, this challenge that we're faced with. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't determine whether or not we are saved, uh, how we act now, or whether Jesus really was who he says he is. But it will determine uh, what people think of his church, what people think um, of him through those who, uh, who, who are his tabernacle on this earth during this time. So let's remember as we, um, as these verses speak to us in a new way, as we are unable to um, meet together with one another, that we that we can still encourage one another and that we can um, draw near to God uh, through, the, through our hearts, uh, which have been sp sprinkled clean by his sacrifice. So whether due to distance or to the virus or anything else, let's just remember that we can draw near uh, to God and to one another. And let's remember that one day there will be no tabernacle, that there will be no, no need for it, because the dwelling place of God will be with man. Um, Revelation 21, verse 3 tells us, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and, he, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Uh, and so I, I will uh, leave you with that today. I thank you so much for for your time and for uh, for letting me speak to you through uh, even this medium. And uh, I look forward so much to um, the day when we can be back together face to face, uh, hopefully very soon. We miss you very much. Uh, and I, I'll turn it over to to Paul. Kyle and, and it, 
it occurs to me that this tabernacle that we're in now, the church, um, it seems strange that, that we're apart from each other, but it's been a distributed tabernacle all along, hasn't it? We say it all the time that the church isn't a building, it's the people. And uh, the, the, the body of Christ uh, is individuals. And right now we're, we're just a little bit farther separated than we're used to, but things haven't really changed. And uh, we, we, we would just encourage each one of you more and more to reach out uh, to others to, to, for encouragement, for uh, just, just, to, just to say hello, uh, or to write a note. Uh, if you want to be really old fashioned, uh, or, or, you know, you can do Facebook and texting and whatever else you want, but that we would be able to, to bridge the gap between uh, uh, each of us. Um, we'll just close this morning. Um, as Paul says in Philippians, he says, in my, let's say I've lost it. Yeah, I don't, I don't. He says, and it's my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for hanging in for a little bit longer. And we look forward to meeting again uh, in Bible studies this week and again next Sunday. Thank you very much. Have a great day.